Well, thank you for what I have learned. I'm not going to use this. <laughs> so, so I'm going to use actually this, uh, and that should be fine. So thank you for the folks at Emory and at Mac for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Can you hear me okay? Good. And uh, so maybe let me add a little bit more about myself, maybe one quick comment. So within Turner, we have obviously a lot of analytics and data science folks. They are actually all across the company in various brands and parts of the organization. Uh, my team in particular uh, sits under actually the strategy, the chief strategy officer of, of Turner. So what we're interested in in particular, it doesn't mean every project, but in particular, we would like to work on projects that are impactful, I would say, on a global scale. So for example, we're gonna to talk to you about, uh, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about data fusion and machine learning, but really in the context of how you manage inventory across the whole organization. So these are projects in some sense that are uh, global in scale. Uh, I'm not here alone, but I couldn't help myself to see that one of my colleagues, Liz Randall, Liz, hi, hi. <laughs> and uh, Liz is actually the director of innovation also under the chief strategy officer, and we have also one more colleague who's not here, who's the head of research uh, at Turner. So the three of us fundamentally form the core team under chief strategy. So with that said, so let me talk to you a little bit about marketing analytics powered by data fusion and machine learning. So. Uh, Let's talk first about what is it, which part of the business that we're really going to address today. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you're going to learn more about TV than you ever really wished for. But hopefully it will be exciting and interesting to you. So this is really the agenda. But, but the first thing that we're going to start with is actually explain how actually the marketplace, how do, we, how do things work in, in, in the TV environment. So, all right. So when you think of... TV, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to sell airtime, correct? Airtime is fundamentally your inventory. It's typically a 15 seconds or a 30, 30 second ad. There is something called the upfront season. The upfront season is something that happens around June, July-ish time frame, where advertisers and agency and media companies get together and where media companies like Turner, NBC, and others, all the big media companies, sell a good chunk of their inventory. How much do you sell of that inventory? It's typically between 60 to 75%. What drives that? A lot of things drive that. Perhaps economic outlook, maybe you want some of the money early on, you know, relationship with the, you know, with the, with the advertisers, the agency, there is a lot of factors. So, but that said and done, you're left with an inventory, correct? You didn't sell all of your inventory. The other remaining inventory is called scatter. So this is your scatter market. Typically, you hope that the scatter market is going to basically have higher prices than, a, than, than the prices that you basically sold at during the upfront. Now, the filler sales. So what is the filler sales? Uh, the filler sales is basically distressed inventory that you couldn't sell. So when you wake up at 2 AM in the morning and you find the funny ads, that's the filler sales. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's no guarantee for the filler sales. For the others, when, ex when I mean there's no guarantee, let me explain what I mean by that. For other ads, when you're working with an advertiser agency, you're selling fundamentally a marketing campaign. And we're gonna talk about how marketing campaigns work and what is it that we're trying to fulfill. A marketing campaign typically has been sold for what, 40, 50 years now, only in the demographic realm of things. So when you're working with an advertiser agency, that advertiser agency is trying to reach a particular segment, correct, of consumers. Typically, in the old paradigm, it's been only demographics. What we're going to talk to you about today is how actually that changed in 2000, started to change in 2014 with some really groundbreaking work that has happened first at Turner before any other uh, cable or, or broadcast company around the U.S. and for that matter around the world. So Turner was the first one actually to introduce something completely different and allow a linear TV platform to be able to do something that you can do in the digital world. So we'll get to that in a moment. But back again, so filler as there's no guarantee. You know, you want to fill that app, but I'm not going to guarantee you how many people per se are going to watch that app. So with that said, how do you basically create the fundamentals of a, of a campaign, correct? So here's an advertiser's agency. They have, they come with a budget. Let's just say they're interested in a particular demographic. 
So what you're seeing here on top, what says primary demo, the demographic that they're interested in in this example is females 25 to 54. It could be any demographic that you can think, think of. It could be people, male or female. What you're seeing uh, across, first thing is the selling title. So what do we mean by selling title? A selling title could be something as big as a day part. I would like to buy in prime time or I would like to be much more specific. Maybe I want to buy in the last ship, not only prime time. It has to be within the last ship, correct? But when you're structuring a deal, you're, you typically buy across many day parts and many selling titles, correct? And you create basically a plan. So this is basically the, the media schedule that was sold, correct? The media schedule that was sold, you know, has a number of units and where they're going to play and in which quarter, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're saying above is the CPM, correct? So how much you know, is it cost per thousand to deliver this particular uh, demographic in female 25 to 54? So the life cycle of a TV, TV media deal, how does that go? So the first piece of a TV media deal, the first thing that you do is the planning, correct? Then there's the second step, the execution. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then the posting. So let me explain. You work with an advertiser agency, you come up with a media plan, a marketing campaign that you're interested in. Second thing is the execution. What is the execution is about? The execution is about deciding where do you actually put that unit, that, that inventory unit that you bought. Why is that a problem? Isn't it something very simple? No. Because at any point in time, for that matter, Turner or any other media company is running thousands and thousands of marketing campaigns. If you go back to this slide, I said, you know, perhaps maybe I bought four units and a particular selling title. Let's just say in prime time. But I did not say at which time exactly I'm going to play or maybe put that, that ad. Why don't you want to do that? Because you have thousands and thousands of marketing campaigns. You want to be able to decide what is the best placement of that spot. Do I give it to this marketing deal or that marketing deal? Because there are many marketing deals that obviously bought into prime time. And the reason you want to decide who gets which spot is because you have all these conflicting, of course, guarantees. You have marketing campaign one that you promise. I don't know what you promise for, correct? Marketing campaign two is also competing and has different delivery, etc. So you have these multiple objectives that are competing and you really have to solve it. Although I don't think we're going to talk about that today through some serious, really, optimization algorithm. Optimization algorithm, by the way, not to digress, but I always take the opportunity because I hear a lot about optimization everywhere I go, and sometimes I want to cry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because people talk about optimizing one thing at a time. There's no optimization of one thing at a time. The idea of optimization is you bring things that are competing for the same resource, for competing for the same something, and you're finding the trade-off. When you're optimizing between quotation, one thing at a time, you're simply ranking something, fulfilling, and that's the no optimization. You're leaving a lot of money on the table. So for optimization purposes, you do not pinpoint where that inventory has to be. I'm going to tell you it is within prime time. You bought within prime time will guarantee that, et cetera, et cetera. So with that said, planning, execution. So planning is what we talked about. Structuring the deal, how is it going to look, the mix of uh, units, where did you buy them, et cetera, the pricing. Execution is when you start running the marketing campaign. How does the marketing campaign run? There is typically a flight for a campaign. It's called the campaign flight date. So let me explain what that means. It could be that it's a campaign across a month that they bought only. Maybe they're just interested around the holiday. So maybe they just bought it around December, let's just say, around Christmas. It could be a longer campaign. It could be many campaigns are typically even a quarter. Some campaign could be across two quarters. So it's whatever is the start date and the end date that the advertiser agency is interested in. The execution, the execution, the decisioning on where you place the ad units doesn't happen very, very early on. Why would it happen very, very early on? Because you want to be smart about using data, correct? There is no need to make decisioning about where you place the, let's just say it's a 13-week campaign, as an example. Why do I want to make the decision where I want to place the unit on week two when I don't have to? 
because I will get new data from Nielsen as an example that I can take in, readjust my forecast, make my forecast optimization smarter. So you, we, you don't make that decisioning about where the units go except just the week ahead. So you don't need to make those decisions more than a week ahead. The reason we don't make them more than a week ahead because we want to take the most recent available data, pass it through our forecasting algorithm, readjust our forecast, pass it through optimization, remake the assessment, understand the efficiency. And I'm not exaggerating. On any, any day, any day, at Turner, 8,000 optimization run in the background at scale in production systems. This is analytics at scale. This is not analytics where, you know, someone is making a decision on their desk where the unit goes. It is machine learning at scale that turns the whole inventory gamut of Turner. And we're not alone to do that, but I will say again, Turner was the first one that did this when it took what used to be optimizing one deal at a time, and they figured out how to optimize all these deals into one system, which we call Crossroad. I see David here, who probably have heard Crossroad, although he's on the data cloud team, but he probably heard about it. That is a system that manages all inventory together of all networks. Okay. And then the posting. Why is posting important? Well, did you deliver what you said you're going to deliver, correct? Did you, I promised me 10 million people in this demographic, whatever that demographic was, were going to basically uh, watched or basically watched the ad for, you know, in, the, in this particular marketing campaign. Well, what happened if you don't deliver 10 million? Let's just say the guarantee for one of those marketing campaigns was, was 10 million. That's a problem. You deliver nine, well, guess what happens? You had that scatter inventory, correct, that you were hoping to sell in the marketplace. You're going to take some of it and fulfill the million, correct, that, you, that was a deficiency. So the other thing that I haven't talked about is that during the execution phase, things are so sophisticated, is that there are techniques that looks about the indexing of every deal. That's, it goes back to my point earlier, why don't we make the decision very early on for the whole flight of the campaign? Because if you look at the indexing, let me explain what indexing means. Indexing means, means how far am I from the objective of the campaign? Am I at 65%, I am at 90%, or am I at 10%? and depending also on the length of the campaign. If my campaign is about to end and I am at 95, but I still have a couple of weeks, that's different than a deal that's at 65% and maybe has three or four weeks, correct? There is logic that decides, you know, some priority for some deal, because you do not want to also over deliver for some marketing campaigns. There is nothing that you're, gain, you're going to gain from, correct? So you have to, in addition to balancing the objective, you have to look at the picture of which one are perhaps might incur higher liability to try and minimize that liability. So posting is when the numbers come, when the numbers come from Nielsen or whoever is providing you with, quote unquote, the truth. We're going to come between quotation, what is the truth, uh, uh, correct, in, in terms of that number that the industry agreed on on, on a standard of some sort. And that's really that posting will, you know, will, will basically report to the advertiser agency and for us what is basically that delta, if there is any delta, what I mean by delta liability, or maybe, you know, we delivered exactly or slightly higher. So hopefully that wasn't too long, but it was too long, but I think we're good. <laughs> so planning, this is exactly what I talked about. It's the aggregate media plan, correct? I didn't say at the placement level. Specific scheduling of spot, this is exactly what I was talking about, shortly before airing, exactly. The deal stewardship, what do we mean by deal stewardship? It's the indexing, how we're pacing, correct? Should we make different decisioning? And finally, determining the audience delivery of air spot based on actuals after spots air. So this is really what we covered in those two slides. Okay. Before we talk about data fusion, for 40 or 50 years, actually, since cable, I guess 1980-something, uh, I was in middle school, I guess, uh, uh, we've been selling what, and even before, guarantees on demographics, correct, for 40, 50 years. Then technology advances, then you get digital platforms, correct? 
this thing here in my pocket, mobile, and others, tablets, correct? Then advertisers agency now can buy, I really wanted to reach a yogurt eater. And yogurt eaters are not necessarily 18 to 24, correct? Can I buy a marketing campaign that gets me to my yogurt eater? By the way, this is a true example. I'm not, I'm not, not trying to be funny, but it is a true example. I wanted tostillos. I mean, um, I can't believe actually people eat these things. Uh, but anyway, uh, tostillos, whatever, you know, those small pizza things. I want to actually reach someone who's a millennial who's interested in a number of things. I don't know, maybe an iPhone, this and that. I would like to reach an auto intender. Actually, I want to be even more specific. I would like to reach someone who's interested in a truck. Not only any truck, a Ford 150. All the examples that I just gave you are real examples that we did and other companies are now starting to do. So when a linear platform, what we call linear TV simply means, uh, we, it, let's just call it TV, I guess. Uh, linear is a legacy term. Uh, the linear TV platform could not do that. So with the advent, correct, of other, uh, other platforms like, you know, a, a Facebook, a Google, or other digital platforms that can deliver to the advertisers agency exactly what they needed, you know, you obviously see that you're going to be at a disadvantage. So how do you make Keep TV relevant in this environment and allow it to compete with these other platforms? Well, if you continue processing demographics data, nothing's going to change. You need somehow a new data source, correct? Okay. Before I go to marketing data fusion, uh, and I guess because I'm, I was an engineer at some point, 21 years before I started analytics and data science and moving to the airline business. In the marketing field, data fusion is actually pretty easy. But actually, if you look at the history of data fusion, data fusion, if anyone knows anything about data fusion besides David and the folks at Turner here, maybe. Anyone else? Does anyone know anything about data fusion? Okay. Data fusion started actually in engineering. The idea of data fusion is that when you have, for example, a couple of sensors, this is going to be relevant. Let's just say measuring a particular process. They're not necessarily measuring the same thing. They could be measuring different things about that same process. How do you take two statistical estimates and from that infer another statistical estimate about something else that you're interested in about the process? There is a whole rich areas of mathematics and analytics and data science, if, if really people are interested in learning about how that field works and what you can really do in that. In the marketing space, some people eventually figured out in the marketing space, we can do that too, but it's much simpler. It's actually much, much simpler. So what is it that I'm talking about? Back to that yogurt eater again, correct? Uh, I shop at Kroger. Uh, do, you do you have that little card? Okay. Uh, you get your discount, correct? But, but you know what happened also with that little card? <laughs> that little card data goes somewhere, and with other little data cards from other places, and they get to some other company, correct? If you take that data about consumer shopping behavior and you fuse it with Nielsen data, we're not going to go through the mathematics. That's not the purpose of that. I want to introduce the concept. And you fuse it with Nielsen data, not only can Nielsen tell me now at 8 o'clock how many people at 8 p.m., let's just say on TBS, in every demographic that you can think of for watching my show, and by the way, they report at the 30-minute level, but they can also tell me how many yogurt eaters, Cheerio buyers. Actually, you can get how many people are interested in Chase credit cards, you know, Sapphire. I guess there is one called Sapphire. I'm a city guy, etc., etc., etc. So imagine now, with the availability of this data, not only did you have historically, correct, a look at everything, correct? in terms of demographics, but also any segment that you can think of. So there are standard segments. The standard segments, you know, would be like, you know, the shopper data, for example, fused with Nielsen. Credit card data fused with whatever. So you can get that. But let's just say we have our own internal data. Let's just say any company that has its own internal data, we can fuse it internally. So we do this here today at Turner, like every other company. You can fuse your own data with, with Nielsen or whatever and then you can get whatever other segments you might be interested in. It's got even much more interesting. What if a marketer has some survey data? You can even fuse survey data. 
with whatever to get some interesting thing that you're interested in, that you're trying to find out, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what we're talking about is, again, that Nielsen data that we were talking about, we're not going to go through the mathematics. That's not the purpose of this. This is simply to say you have one data source and you have another data source. The consumer purchasing data is what I was talking about, correct? In this case, it will be the, the shopper. There's actually a pretty well-known company that does this. I don't know if you heard Catalina. Catalina is a company that specializes in that. There's another co company called Prism that specializes, I think, uh, card data. There is MRI, there is whatever. There's a whole list of companies that do data fusion. But every company also today does their own internal data fusion to get some other insights about audiences they're interested in. So you fuse these two things and whoops, you get the thing that you're interested in. So it's demographic data and purchasing characteristics. So you can find maybe Cheerio buyers, et cetera, whatever you're interested in. But the origins of data fusion is actually in engineering. In the marketing space, actually, they're pretty simple. M much simpler. Much simpler. OK. Well, guess what happened? Wow. Now we can have compact car buyers, technology enthusiasts. This is all true example on linear TV. Fine dining lovers, oh my God, we've been selling demographics for 50 years. E-commerce shoppers, exotic. This is now available on TV. Well, what does this do? It changes the whole paradigm. Why does it change the whole paradigm? I can now compete. If someone wants to buy demographics, we can still do this. But if you want to buy a finer, much more granular segment that you're interested in, we can also do this. Okay, so in 2014, October 2014 was actually the first time we launched the first marketing campaign. In the fall of 2014, Turner launched uh, audience targeting. The first thing that we launched is something called targeting now. So let me explain what's targeting now. In the world of demographics, when you, do you remember when we talked about structuring that deal? Advertiser agencies, you know, wanted to buy whatever, but they had some constraint. Maybe I don't want my Coke ad next to the Pepsi ad, correct? These are serious. You know, I don't want all my units to be, I don't know, clustered in whatever. They want some equitable distribution of some sort. There's a lot of constraints that, that you know, advertiser agency can get, and that's fine because the optimization, do you remember? Not only does it look at the objective, but all the constraints. If, is anyone in an industrial engineering background here in this room? Yes, 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 okay. So you understand mixed integer programming, linear programming, stochastic programming, not, okay. This is what we're talking about. It's solving these problems at scale. With tons of constraints, hundreds and hundreds of columns, you understand what I'm talking about, very, very complicated stuff. But that's what optimization, true optimization can allow you to do. So in the targeting now, when you're introducing a new concept to the marketplace, you know, people are not gonna jump immediately. They obviously wanna see you know, how is this going to work? And, you know, I've been used to do business in a particular way. What is it perhaps maybe uh, a bridge product before we really go to complete audience targeting? So the way I describe personally, personally, targeting now is a bridge product. Why is it a bridge product? Because it allows you to buy the audience target that you're interested in, correct? But if you still want those constraints and being on a single network, that's fine. We can still do that. So that's the, the idea of targeting now. The second product is called audience now. What is audience now all about? Why are you buying? If you're interested in auto intenders, auto intenders are not only on TBS. I'm pretty sure there's auto intenders on Adult Swim and Boomerang. I'm pretty sure there's yogurt eater across all the network. The question is, do we find them or do we think we can predict where they are, correct? In particular volumes or, or, or mass or, you know, that is you know, sufficient to be able to sell them. So, because in the old world, correct, of demographic people thought, this content is going to attract this particular demographic, and this is the demographic I'm interested in for that particular product, correct? So audience now says, don't look at buying only a single network. Look at a whole portfolio of networks. We can make a proposal across all 11 portfolio that we have at, at Turner. You know what? You remember we were structuring a deal, one network by one network. Earlier I gave the example of TBS. Imagine now you have a proposal across all of the the Turner Network. So that's the power of Audience Now. Audience Now is across all the networks and we relax a lot of the constraints. There's no need for you to whatever because, you know, we find, uh, I don't know, yogurt eaters here and Tostillo buyers. Actually, I remember pretty late at night, which told me someone was really drunk and needed something. 
pretty fatty and cheesy, whatever, to eat very late at night. I mean, you find these clusters and these insights that people were like, wow, that was really, really interesting. Okay, before we, we go further, do you remember when I said we did data fusion, correct? Okay, data fusion is great. But data fusion tells you what happened in the past. That's half the equation. You're not going to be able to sell unless you can predict what's going to happen in the future, correct? Because what happened in the past is not in isolation of the content, correct, that you had on your networks, of the content that other networks were, were you know, uh, broadcasting or, or, or had available for consumers. So you need a predictive capability, correct? You need some really capable, accurate, predictive algorithm that can tell you the behavior of any segment in the future over the quarter, let's just say, that's upcoming where you're going to be running marketing campaigns. And we're going to talk briefly about that. So in that space, what do you think um, you know, is going to be needed? What's going to be needed, so if you have a whole year of, of history, correct, of what any particular audience behaved on any network that you can think of, you need to be able to predict their behavior in the future. Uh, how do you think consumers, you know, obviously a consumer watched a content, but that content was not in isolation with other content on other networks. So one of the things that we've done at Turner, we figured out a methodology, a predictive capability, which we call CAE, which stands for Competitive Audience Estimation. The genesis of the idea is the following, is that at any point in time, a consumer has choices across networks, correct? So we, we can all be, let's just say, for the sake of example, let's just say we're all in the same audience target that the advertiser agency is interested in. It doesn't mean all of us made the same choice and watched TBS, but we went into different directions. Some of us may have watched TBS more, more whatever. But imagine a lot of these audiences, correct, whatever they are. But if you, have you used consumer choice modeling? I know I'm a little data scientist. So if people are familiar with consumer choice modeling or the framework of consumer choice modeling, the idea of consumer choice modeling is that you think of the problem, and that's not the only way to think about the problem, but the way I thought about it is that you have a choice set. You know, if people are going selecting a particular content, you're probably increasing the utility of that content. What's increasing the utility of that content is the attribute of that content, the attribute of the content, the genre, repeat, new, life, sport, whatever. And there's a whole list of attributes. We're not going to go through them. But also when you played that content. What do you mean when you played that content? Did you play it around Christmas? Was it around the holiday? Was it sometime in the summer? And what were you competing against? Because the other thing that we have is not only our own data, but the data of the whole industry. So you can think of the problem as a consumer choice problem. It doesn't mean I sat at home and I looked at the whole menu and I decided, no, it's an approximation, correct? It's an approximation. You can think of the problem as something like that that increased the content. And that worked for us. When we solved the predictive capability, the predictive capability that I'm talking about, and we were able to forecast literally with accuracy with an MAPE, mean absolute percentage error, because typically business people like that better than standard deviation and MSE and mean square errors, and that makes sense. Uh, and I like MAPE too. I'm talking within an MAPE of 20 to 25% in worst cases. That's incredibly powerful. Imagine that I can know not only at the 30 minute level, but we forecast at the 30 minute level because data is reported at the 30. We can even do it at the minute level. At the minute level, I can tell you on any network, not only our own, anyone else's network if I have the programming, what I think is going to happen on their network. If you have that insight about what's going to happen in the marketplace within a statistical accuracy, of course, the expected accuracy is good. Then if you solve the predictive capability, you have the data fusion, you can change your world. So with that, I'm going to introduce, I guess, a video that we have used at CES. I don't know if any of you are familiar with CES. Consumer Electronics Show that talks a little bit about that and it'll give me a break uh, so I can have some water. Last year we started something, something big, something bold. We created a new way to do audience targeting in television. We broke the rules and made new ones. Many of our agencies and advertisers were brave enough to blaze this new trail with us. At Turner, we are committed to pushing things even further. Powered by new data sets and advanced analytics, basic program selection has been transformed into true media optimization. Simple historical indices just don't cut it. 
Our solutions are powered by a best-in-class predictive model called Competitive Audience Estimation, or CAE for short. CAE builds true audience estimates for any data set. We've tested CAE with industry-leading data sets like Nielsen, TRA, and even first-party data. CAE builds estimates at the 30-minute level so that we can place units where your target audience will be. It's the most granular audience estimation tool in the market today. We have multiple patents pending to prove it. CAE gives our partners a quantifiable advantage and it powers all of our targeting innovations. In 2014, Targeting Now launched on TBS and TNT, allowing a progressive group of advertisers to begin testing the waters. With Targeting Now, we were able to maintain their day part mix, guarantee demo impressions, and could still negotiate on their demo CPMs. But Targeting Now also optimized their schedules so they could get more of the audience target they care about most. In 2015, we launched Targeting Now 1.0, and all of our beta partners renewed, and many new partners took the leap with us. There are over 75 deals slated to run in 2016, and we have real results to share. Across the 30 campaigns that have been completed, every single one saw lift in target delivery, with an average lift of 27% and a high of 51%. That means that Targeting Now schedules deliver significantly more in-target impressions than standard schedules. And on TBS and TNT, it's fueling real results for our clients. Targeting Now has changed the game, so we are doubling down by adding more automation and by fourth quarter, new beta versions of Targeting Now will be available on three more Turner networks. With these moves, Targeting Now will truly scale. And in 2016, we're pushing things even further with Audience Now, the most aggressive audience targeting initiative in linear TV. With Audience Now, you pick the data, you pick the audience target, and Turner delivers, guaranteed, across all our networks. Like Targeting Now, Audience Now is powered by our CAE model. We can plan against any target audience, negotiate any target CPM, and guarantee the target impressions. We are excited to announce that we have partnered with three blue chip advertisers to launch the beta. Together, we are collaborating to build the future of audience targeting in TV. Turner's Audience Now and Targeting Now are changing the way television is bought and sold. We're moving beyond day parts, demos, and CPMs to make our media work harder for you. We are rewriting the rules to create a more engaging and relevant advertising experience that puts the consumer first. Together, we can take smart risks, be bold, and change everything. Let's start something. So, we launched this in 2014. It was targeting now, and it progressed from 75 deal, no, initially it was 10 deals that first quarter, to now we're much more than 100 campaigns. We're going to talk later about where we're heading with this, with the, with the growth of that line of business regarding audience targeting. So, machine learning. Where's the machine learning? It's the competitive audience estimation component that's actually supervised machine learning. It's not unsupervised. You have to train it, you have to develop model, take it to scale. And then the other one is obviously the proposal and schedule optimization piece. You know, writing mixed integer programming with stochastic whatever, et cetera, and at scale, it's another example of machine learning at scale supervised. This is where data fusion came. We talked a little bit about that. Rechanging the equation with better data, new data sources, and how you really use new data sources, how we're able to get new data sources and really come up with something completely, you know, revolutionary really in our business. But that was one part of the story. Okay, you got new data, you have new estimates. Well, you need the predictive capability to understand how you think this audience is going to work in the future. And then you still have to make the decision. The proposal, do you remember the proposal piece? So that proposal piece is not any more demographics. You can, we still sell demos. If someone wants to insist on demos, of course, we can sell them demos. But we can sell now any, any audience in the proposal piece that we described earlier and the schedule optimization. So these are the two machine learning components. So, Again, let me, let me explain a little bit about uh, CAE. So CAE, again, it's that consumer choice framework that I talked about earlier, correct? When you forecast uh, a pro for the next quarter, we have incredible forecasts at the 30-minute level with the accuracy that I described for most audience targets, correct? If the audience sometimes or, or is, 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 is very, very small, quote-unquote, and you know, irregular, 
I won't call it irregular, maybe un unstable as much as you would like. Uh, typically, that we have criteria whether actually we will even forecast it. Because if the universe is not stable, that audience is not stable, it's really ad hoc, more or less. You do not want to sell against it, so we can say no. But it's, there are audiences that are much more stable and audiences that are certainly you do not want to buy into. So they, in some sense, the accuracy varies. But for more audiences that are generally, you know, is what advertiser agencies are interested in, those statistics that I gave you typically hold. So when you're also selling in that space, the other thing that we're able to do, if I'm forecasting at the 30-minute level, I can create proposals for advertiser agencies because my forecast is pretty accurate. I, you know, I can think I have a pretty good idea what I can and cannot guarantee, and we have that proposal. But the other thing that I would like maybe to talk about is this last bracket, reach. Forever, uh, we couldn't really do reach even on linear on TV. Let me explain what reach is. You're selling 10 million impressions, but what this was really those 10 people watching the ad a million times, each one of them. <laughs> I, I know I'm exaggerating, but the point is, it's about duplication. Uh, you know, if Wes continues to watch the ad 100 times, I'm, you know, and he's, you know, it doesn't mean anything, correct? I may, you want to, in some sense, the reach and frequency. On, a, on other platforms, you have, you understand, reach and frequency who watched. On linear, we were not able to do that before. Because they have these forecasts at that granular level, we can create proposals that, we, that will give us guarantee of also not only the impressions, but also what type of reach. So we can also sell today with a reach metric, which we were never able to do uh, on linear TV. So what is the proposal and schedule optimization? It's basically fulfilling what we talked about earlier, correct? You have these objectives and you have these constraints. But now imagine the problem for, for the industrial engineers who love optimization type stuff. Imagine now you're selling, it's not only demographics, you know, but also audiences of different sizes and, you know, some things maybe the audience, tar audience deals do not have as many constraints, correct? But the other one are still constrained. And you have to optimize across all these thousands of marketing campaigns that are going at the same time. Um, dynamic pricing based on demand and availability of commercial inventory. This is simply saying that with these forecasts that we have, correct, that are pretty accurate, the proposal piece, you know, have better now understanding of what's really possible in the marketplace for these very granular sub, uh, uh, segments and what you could do in terms of, 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 of pacing. Pacing in-flight re-optimization. This is something that we introduced that wasn't there. So let me explain what in-flight re-optimization is. In-flight re-optimization means, do you remember when we were talking about those deals that were not doing good, et cetera, et cetera? But let's just say there are some deals maybe in the audience targeting, whatever, where we want to, let's just say, enforce a re-optimization at a particular point in time, we can do that even too today. So these are the two machine learning component that really drives audience targeting. So within, this is the predictive capability, the competitive audience estimation. The proposal and schedule optimization, the proposal piece is actually an optimization problem because obviously they have a budget, if you remember, correct? They have a CPM, we have a CPM in mind, whatever, depending on the inventory they're selecting and the mix, whatever might be, and the constraints, et cetera. So the proposal piece is not simply, oh, buy me this, whatever. I mean, they, you have a budget, you have things that you need, then it is actually an optimization problem, but it's a proposal optimization problem. One, pro you know, giving all these constraints, what's the best proposal? The, op the schedule optimization is that decisioning the week ahead that we talked about. But imagine it now having much more segments to optimize across. Uh, so this is the methodology. I think I talked pretty much about it. Uh, it's a dynamic, like I said, uh, uh, capability that can really forecast anything that you can think of. Let me, let me here pause very quickly. Competitive audience estimation was used, you know, we developed it because we're thinking of audience targeting. But we obviously can use it even for demographics, correct? It doesn't care whether it has a yogurt here. It just cares, give me the segment that you're interested in. A demographic is still a segment, so it can forecast anything. So these are really the, the, the particular, I guess, if you want to call them uh, analytics that, are, that drive the CAE uh, methodology. But really what I have talked about earlier is really the description. It's about consumer choice modeling, understanding the behavior, the utility, et cetera, and how actually based on the new programming, the new content, you provided just a program. This is the programming on TBS, 
This is all the audiences I'm interested in. Can you forecast? But uh, let's make sure we, we, I'm clear on that. You calibrate the model over the audience that you're interested in, then you forecast the audience you're interested in. It's not one model calibrated over all the audiences, no. And one audience behaves differently than another. So you calibrate it over auto intenders, then you forecast auto intenders. You calibrate it over whatever, Cheerio buyers, and you forecast whatever. So that's what I mean. But because the weighting of the, of, of, of the various attributes that, that impact the decisioning is, will be different by, by target. And that's what I was talking about, and I think I covered all of that. But the thing that I would like you maybe to, that, that I like about the methodology is that it doesn't only take into account what's happening obviously at Turner, but it looks at the whole landscape and understand the impact of the competitive effect. So that's why the, the word competitive. The word competitive is simply to say, I'm competing for an audience, an audience that had choice. Can I understand the effect of my competitors in their decisioning on select me or not to select me? Like I said, the time of day, day in year, month, quarter, where you are. Why is this important? For the same reason, you know. Was I playing this content over the holiday, but maybe people were not interested in watching that because it is the holidays. Maybe I'm better off, etc. playing somewhere else. Without going, uh, digressing too much, I'm not sure if you see perhaps what other particular uses of this methodology could be. Can you think of programming optimization? If you have a pretty good idea of forecasting demographic of audiences, you know, you can actually optimize how you decide your programming schedule. I'm not going to talk about that. It's not purpose, but, but all I'm trying to say that this methodology impacted other things that you can do within the company, correct? You can do better programming optimization. You can do better promo optimization. Because if you understand the behavior of any segment that you're interested in, say, you know what, the programming schedule, I probably should shift it a little differently to attain whatever is my objective. Targeting now, so this is what we talked about earlier. You still have pretty much uh, the same uh, constraints that you allowed, correct, that I mentioned earlier in the demo world. What I have here in this, on the left side, is that, okay, you still have deal one with target segment one, yogurt eaters, whatever it is, cheer, whatever, just imagine whatever. But I've also put demo-based deals, simply to say, we're, it's not like we're out of the demo deals business. All I'm simply saying, we have deals like this and deals like that, and we're optimizing all of this together. The lift goal. I don't know if you remember in the video, there was this number 27%, I think, when mentioned early on. That was after the year 2014. But very quickly, the 27%, what is the lift goal? And actually, that's what we guarantee on in, in targeting now. Let me explain this. If you're buying in demographics and I achieve an impression, and I'm telling you, forget about that. Buy directly into auto intenders. The question will be, well, what was the benefit, correct, of me buying directly into the auto intenders? Well, the simple, the simple answer would be, let me show you how many auto intenders you would have gotten if you simply bought in the demo world. Let me tell you in that schedule that you would have bought how many auto intenders truly were there. In the new schedule that you bought, ah, you had 27% more auto intenders. That's the lift that we're talking about. That buying directly into the segment that you're interested in is actually better than simply thinking in the demo world because you're leaving other auto intenders out of the demographic that you're interested in. Now, that number 27% was based on the early couple of years. That number is actually around 20%. After you know you have run many, many more and more campaigns, this number is actually around 20% lift, and 20% lift average is a big thing for advertiser agency of more the audience and the target and the consumers that you're interested in. So the median schedule here uh, is simply saying, you know, that that's what I was just mentioning. Had you bought in the other schedule in the demo world, what would have happened? We're talking about that difference. Ah, audience now is even much more interesting. Do you remember the proposal piece I don't know if you notice, here it's really over one network, correct? That's why there wasn't really a blue box in the middle, because in the targeting and in the demo world, you bought one network at a time. Here, imagine the proposal piece. You can buy across the whole portfolio, a proposal across all networks. That's, you know, the short-term CAE, the spot scheduling is really things that we talked about. If you're interested in the Q&A, if you have any, which I hope, I'm happy to talk to you about those details if you're really, really interested. 
And the spot scheduling, we still have constraints, a lot of constraints. You still have constraints from the demo world. You still have constraints even from, you know, targeting world and audience world are typically hopefully less. Well, some of them are, let's just say, let me explain this. Maybe we decide that we find a lot of the audience on NBA TV, correct? But maybe the ad was like, you know what, I don't want it's 80 percent of my inventory. It doesn't feel right. Okay, um, no more than 50 percent. So you can put constraints like that. My brand, I don't want it to be associated with that content, correct? What, whatever it is, it's a brand, whatever that brand is. You can add constraints like that. So my point is, in the audience world, there are still constraints that you have like that. I want at least 10% on TBS. That's fine. Those type of things. Uh, where does this innovation took us? We have actually much more than four patents pending. Actually, the last list, I think it's now up to eight because we've taken this work beyond audience targeting. And maybe I'll, at the end, if I have a minute, I'll mention only one project. Uh, Turner has been recognized. In 2015, we won the Emmy Award for Engineering and Technology. Uh, I, my mom's from New York, and I called and I said, I'm part, you know, not me alone, me and the IT teams. Of course, the IT team built the, the, the system. We put the engine, the algorithm. She said, there must be something wrong in the world if you have an Emmy that you're associated with. <laughs> And I actually, it's so funny, I have it on my LinkedIn. It's not, anyway, so we have an Emmy in engineering and technology. I didn't even know they gave these things for, for us. <laughs> uh, there is a bunch of awards. The Ad Research Foundation, I would say, is the most important one. The Ad Research Foundation in 2016 recognized the work that Turner has done in audience targeting as the work in, in that field. And for those people who go to Informs, probably the ISYE, Industrial Engineers, they know that we won, we just won actually the 2017 Informs Award for Analytics. That was actually this past April. Uh, Advanced Analytics are a huge... Uh, very quickly. What I was going to talk about next is another video from the Senior Vice President of Innovation Programmatic on the business side, who's going to talk about the benefits, and we're going to wrap up. Advanced analytics are a huge part of what we're doing here at Turner. They effectively power all of our audience targeting solutions in the linear space. And it really starts with competitive audience estimates, or CAE. CAE is our proprietary model that enables us to build audience estimates at the 30-minute level, at the exact day. And it's really that level of precision and granularity that enables us to drive massive amounts of effectiveness and efficiency for advertiser partners. We've been extremely pleased with the, with the demand that we've seen around audience targeting in the marketplace today. Our goal, as stated by our president, Donna Speciali, is by 2020 to effectively sell 50% of our inventory against audiences. And again, with the, the fantastic analytics that we've built and the solutions that they've powered, we're very confident in that goal. So we see this as being really a huge part of our business going forward. And not only here at Turner, we actually see this as a huge part of the industry moving forward. We see the world moving towards audiences. We've seen fantastic results from our audience targeting solutions. The analytics that, that we use within our solutions have been able to drive amazing amounts of efficiency for advertiser partners. On average, we're seeing gains of roughly 20% in terms of incremental impressions delivered against target audiences. That's 20% more of the impressions you care about most. And the great part is we're pairing ROI solutions with our audience targeting capabilities. And when we do that, what we find is that we can effectively drive increases in the KPIs you care about most, many times sales. We're seeing sales lifts of anywhere from 3 to 10% when we effectively use audience targeting. Again, 3 to 10% more product sales driven by effectively targeting the audiences you care about most. So like Dan said, more than 110. This slide is actually a little old, like probably in six or nine, six months. 50% uh, of the inventory by 2020. Uh, just look publicly how many billions of dollars we are as a company, and you take that number, divide by two, that should give you an idea, since I cannot share the numbers of the blue and the red and the black, whatever. That's a few billion dollars by 2020, rechanging the whole to stay relevant. That's a big thing. So that's what I mean at scale, solutions at scale that impact the company globally. Uh, three to 10 percent, three to 10 percent more of the sales than, than they would usually have had. It's a win-win for the advertising agencies and for us to keep linear TV relevant. With that, uh, this is the summary. I think I, I talked enough, but that's pretty much what I said. We really disrupted the TV world. Uh, we really, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of a team that looks at projects that takes analytics at scale. 
And with that, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm going to walk around and try and give folks the mic. Um, hopefully the feedback has dropped off a little bit. I, I just want to say, uh, Wes, I first saw you speak a couple years ago at Informs, actually, and I thought then that what you were doing was probably one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time in, in the media space. In fact, when I was at Coke, um, you know, we had the digital and social teams talking about all these you know, audiences that they could reach and TV is dead and this kind of thing. But through you know, data fusion, analytics at scale, responding to dynamic nature of the market, I, I think that innovation is um, you know, changing that conversation again. So um, very interesting work. Um, all right, let me walk around here. Familiar face, so. Hey, Mike. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, it was very interesting listening to it. Um, I'm going to take something from the uh, you know pertaining headlines these days, the okay. the headlines these days, the Russian media intervention and stuff like that. What is the influence of ethics in the analytical methods that you employ? Sure. I mean, anything that we do uh, protects the you know the consumer and the brand engagement. I mean, anything that we do at Turner and in any other company. You know, when I'm describing these segments, it doesn't say it's West that we're reaching. It's an aggregate of a number in the same way the demographic. So in anything, I mean, I love Turner. I think Turner is a great company. It's the company actually I worked for the longest in my life. That should tell you something about its culture and, and its wonderful place. So anything that we do maintain, obviously, the integrity of the relationship with the consumer and the brand engagement with that consumer. And actually, you know, since you touch on that subject, maybe I want to talk about the next project that we're working on, how you take this actually to the next step, to the next phase, how you keep that up actually while protecting that relationship between consumer, brand, advertisers, and agency. Hi, my name is Tyler Howard. I'm a data scientist at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, so I highly appreciate your Chase uh, Sapphire Reserve reference earlier. <laughs> Millennial car, if you're a millennial, don't have it, go ahead and get yourself one. Um, so uh, as a data scientist, I think CAE is really cool. I would like to tinker with it, uh, talk to you about it a little bit. Sure. Um, and uh, I'm curious, what data do you not already uh, feed it that you would love to feed it? What data like, uh, okay, is outstanding? So, so, uh, I mean, CAE does very well, Thank like you. I said, with a lot of this stuff. So one thing that, uh, that actually we're working on is like for movies, correct? Because when I was saying these attributes, these attributes are actually available for typical programming. You can actually get from Nielsen a lot of these attributes that you have. The, the thing that we're working on, well, how do you forecast better for movies, correct? Et cetera, you know, how do you do something like this better? But then the other thing, since both of you touch on something, let me actually jump in and talk exactly about the next thing because it touched a little bit about your consumer type question and about, you know, what is the things perhaps which say you can do better, okay. Uh, why do we have ads the way we have them today, at two minutes, whatever is the number, and you lump them all together? It doesn't make sense, in my opinion, correct? At the end of the day, a consumer is watching a content, and you have a, you know, a reaction to that content, correct? You know, and many people, many audiences are watching the same content, but each one of them have a different reaction, etc. What if we put the ad at the right time, for the right consumer, at the right place? Well, how are you going to do that? And one of the things that we're working on, actually the patent will be filed before Thanksgiving, <laughs> is, uh, is the following. You have closed caption data, correct? You have images, you have whatever. What if you take that, the closed caption data, and what we're doing today is through natural language processing and artificial intelligence, you can tell the storyline, understand what is really, I mean, that's really a little incredibly, you know, what you can do really with analytics, sophisticated analytics. You can take a content, closed caption, and say exactly what's the storyline. If you know the storyline, and you know which audience is watching, maybe it's better off to play the ad at minute eight, when the scene ends, you don't disrupt everything completely. <laughs> you know, it has to be a natural, in some sense, break. And then you play one ad that is much more impactful to the advertising agency. So the thing that we're doing today in our proof of concept with my team is that to think about the next thing. The next thing could be 
We don't need, really need as many ads. Like Dan said earlier, you heard Dan, the ROI is typically about sale or some other metric. It's not always sale, correct? What if we simply say, let's forget about impressions and reach and all of that. Your goal is to reach whatever says. Let me reach you the audience that you're interested in. A 15 seconds ad at minute eight is much more impactful than a 30 second ad, blah, 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 and you buying 10 million impressions. This is where we're going. But in that also paradigm, it's again, how do you respect that, you know, we're keeping that all in mind. But back to you said, is CAE today, you know, will be used in, into something like this. Do you remember when I said the minute level? So the minute level, yes, we can do this minute level with the content. The reason we're interested in movies because I want to be able also to forecast movies at the minute level, et cetera. So there is other data that I don't have today, have today like metadata, correct, related to the movie, who was the actor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's simply not available today. It's something we're working on to be able to do this new, what we call contextual, contextual audience ad scheduling. So the idea is you want to schedule, but in terms of the context. Context is relevant. That's the whole idea in my mind. Context is relevant. Context is always relevant in any situation. What was the context of this comment? What was the context of that reaction? What was the context of that experience that that consumer had? The other thing I'll add, the other thing we're doing, not only that, what was the sentiment that content invoked at a particular point in time? Do you want to put an insurance ad? Do you want to put which insurance ad of the creative? So it's tying even the creative with the consumer at the right time with the right message. Yeah, so this is where we're going but always keeping in mind what you both asked. But today I won't say that we do movies well. Uh, it's very hard during uh, you know, sports and, and jumps and stuff like that, the live stuff. Yeah, but the one I'm focusing on is the movie piece today, to be able not only to forecast at very minute, but also to take this project, because movies is also another place where you wanna do the ads and the breaks at the right time. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm Amy Kamara, VP of Marketing for Emory Healthcare here, um, uh, just down the street. And I love what you're doing from a precision targeting with television. But I want to um, really ask about that 3 to 10% lift. Uh -huh. um, how are you partnering with your advertisers to then connect the delivery of the ad to lead generation, lead acquisition, and then ROI? OK. Uh, so you know, when I said uh, audience now, correct? And I said we sell by impression, we sell by reach, but actually audience now is a catalog, is a catalog of things. Some people just want to buy by impression, I don't need you to report to me on ROI. Some people want to buy by reach, but there is, we have other products within audience now. The way I think of it is like a catalog. Okay, you want what in the catalog? There's something we call, as an example, response now. Response now is the idea is you watch this ad, then you tie it to other data sources. Uh, web traffic, people visiting store, etc. There is other data sources that come into measuring the ROI piece. The ROI piece is not with the stuff that I showed you alone. You're right. There is other things on how you measure ROI. The one product in particular that you know we're testing a lot and have actually gained quite a bit, uh, some traction, and you know some, and, and the ROI that, that Dan mentioned is, for example, response now. Response now will, will 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 link other data sources that we get from other whatever about you know, traffic into the store, web activity related, et cetera, to this, et cetera. So this is how we're measuring the, the, the ROI in terms of sales. That's one example. So, but, but audience now, if you interact with Turner, there's a whole list of things that you can buy in the audience piece. I don't want to buy impression alone. I want to buy impression, but I would like you to get into me this. Well, okay, this is the product. Give me access to that data source and we can measure it the way they want to measure it. Yep. So I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to take a break. Um. Thank you, Eric. Hi, uh, my name is uh, T.I. Uh, I'm a marketing faculty member at Emory, um, and uh, my research is based on consumer choice model, and I teach a little bit in my class, um, so I'm glad um, that is actually uh, being used in, um, in industry. Yep. Um, so I saw that you have a lot of constraints, that so your customers have constraints. I don't want to put more than 50% and whatnot. So these constraints, in some ways, help you to increase predictability because the space, state space for uh, possible combinations of ads is kind of limited in some ways. But do you challenge your customers to say? Actually, I disagree. It doesn't okay. give me a lot of flexibility. It actually makes it harder. The placement problem becomes harder when you have. If my space is put me in prime time, 
and no constraints, I have all of prime time. If my space is put me in prime time, whatever, correct? But don't put me next to this advertiser because I don't like them too much or I don't like this. And, you know, your space search, correct, is becoming smaller and smaller. The more you, you add constraints, the optimization problem becomes really, really small. In some cases, I'm not saying that whatever. If, if you're an optimization person, you would realize sometimes there is no feasible solution, correct? For right. the optimization people, there's something called there's no feasible solution because you can find the solution. Minimizing, you know, putting the space, more constraints makes it harder for the optimization and for us. It, it's not the other way around. I disagree. But if there's a feasible solution, then your predictability would be higher for a smaller space. Okay, but okay, let's talk a little bit about that. The predictive capability is separate from the optimization capability. The predictive capability happens first, correct? So you, you, you mentioned the consumer choice model. The consumer choice model is just saying this is the forecast. The optimization says, thank you. Here's the data about yeah. the forecast. Let me look at all the marketing campaigns. Thank you for the intelligence CAE for what we think is going to happen. Let me add that information to hopefully make a better decision within my little space that you've stuck me in, uh, advertising agents. That they're separate. This is an input to the optimization right. piece, and it is an input to the proposal piece. So, so actually, uh, my question is, do you challenge your customers a lot in terms of expanding the oh, space? Oh, of course, of course. So, so I'm so glad, OK, this is good. Uh, there is one. This is good. <laughs> Okay, so we finally got okay, to, the, to the question that, that I like or makes sense. Okay, so there is actually a project going on. Uh, it's not something at Globe, it's an analysis. So there is someone on, on the team that I have asked, what's the value of a constraint, correct? What is the value of a constraint? Uh, adding a constraint is causing me, you know, to lose this or to add that. So actually, um, but it always ends up you know, falling in the back. You know, we have so many big initiatives, and this is an analysis, and we only have so many resources. So actually, there is the value of constraints. It's actually on my roadmap. It's been on roadmap for a year, but I can't get anyone to work on it because every time someone works on it, some other big thing happens. You are right. The value of constraints is important. Why is it important? Because I would like to understand how much more I should be charging because of that. Uh, so, if you have a good OR person or data scientist, uh, we actually may have one position, so if they want to talk to me, <laughs> and maybe they can work on that question as a start. So, Wes, thank you very much. A great presentation. We're going to break until 10.40, uh, and then we'll continue on with the, uh, with the session. Thank, thank you, everyone.